Right, I think we'll get going. And uh, this is, for me, one of the favourite parts of the Royal College of GPs calendar events, which is the William Pickles lecture, not least because I can actually remember giving this lecture and how terrified I was beforehand because it always seemed as if much older and more uh, established GPs gave this lecture and suddenly I thought, oh my God, I'm one of them. But uh, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Vijay Naya, who's going to give us the 2021 William Pickles lecture. And Vijay, for those of you who don't know him, is one of those fabulous sort of unsung heroes of our profession who has done spectacular work around medical education and general practice education for years and has really turned the dial on our profession and done fabulous work. He's been a GP in Bedford for over 30 years and we first met, I think, when I went to Bedford and shocked him that I told him I lived there and was probably one of his neighbours. But he's currently Health Education England's clinical lead for GP induction and return to practice schemes and the primary care differential attainment lead, which two vital, vital roles, especially at this time. He's a visiting professor at Cranfield University and is a member of the faculty of Harford Macy Institute for Leading Innovations in Healthcare and Education. He's interested in how we can promote equity and fairness in education and training through compassionate and inclusive leadership by creating working cultures and practices that promote cultural safety for the benefit of organisations and individuals. And what an amazing man. And we're going to be in for a treat when he gives the lecture. But first of all, I'd just like to invite Vijay to join us to the screen. Before you come, though, can I just say that this, this is being live streamed to those who are listening remotely and will be available on YouTube. So this is still... The, 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 this is we're still organised in the sort of the hybrid days. So lovely to you all for coming, but we've also got more. So Vijay, can I introduce? Can I invite you to come up to deliver the 2020 William Pickles lectures? But first, can I award you with the Wim, uh, William Pickles? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When I told Simon Gregory I was doing this lecture, he said he didn't sleep for two years before the lecture, so that really inspired confidence. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dame Claire, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm most honoured and humbled to be giving this lecture, uh, and not a little uncomfortable, following in the footsteps of so many eminent people who have delivered it. But then again, I suppose I've got a bit used to feeling uncomfortable in my life. My story started um, in the 60s. Uh, my parents were required to leave East Africa, and my father had a brother in England and a brother in the US, so he decided to come to England. Uh, many years later, I did say to my dad, you know, California, Bedford, <laughs> it was a close call, really. But growing up in the 70s for people of colour wasn't always easy. Uh, my father took the first job he could, which was to be a bus conductor. My mother worked in a factory. I was very lucky. I got a free place in an independent school where I felt a complete outsider, the only ethnic minority pupil, certainly none on the staff. Didn't talk about my background. But going to medical school actually helped to create those relationships uh, and friendships that have lasted a lifetime. And, of course, general practice gave me my home. For most of that time, I've been in medical education. You get a bit emotional talking about it. People see us with our successes and our achievements. What they don't see is the struggles that have led to that point. And it's those struggles I want to talk to you about today because they're shared by so many uh, ethnic minority doctors, doctors have qualified abroad. I'm going to talk mainly about doctors, but this applies to all health professionals. Their struggles are very similar. 61% of the doctors on the GMC register are ethnic minority background. And 28% on the register are international graduates. 
And in fact, more international graduates joined the register two years ago than UK graduates. We look at GP starters, and this is HE figures over the years. You can see that the number of ethnic minority doctors has gradually increased. And last year, this was 61%, which reflects the GMC background rate. Number of overseas doctors has increased even more. And you can see that the number's there. 53%, over half of the doctors starting in general practice training in England were overseas graduates. It's their journey I'd like to talk to you about next, the struggles that they face, which starts in their countries, fears and expectations before you even leave your country, going into a new country, new culture, new way of working, faced with complex immigration systems, having to do your language exam, the PLAB test, which has been delayed because of the pandemic. And then when you arrive here, faced with new culture, new way of living, joining overstretched NHS workforce, linking with others. Really difficult. So you can imagine adjustment at times is very difficult. Dealing with change, coping with change, being taught in a different way. We, we used to, they might be used to a more didactic style, whereas here we promote a Socratic heuristic style. Concepts of professionalism, the doctor-patient relationship may differ in your home country. Ethical frameworks, duties of a doctor may be different. So there's no wonder that they report difficulties fitting in and belonging. And the stories I hear. But imagine doing all that. And when you're here, you're faced with differential attainment. This has now entered the vernacular of medical education. It means that certain groups, ethnic minority background, overseas doctors, but those with other protected characteristics, disabilities, long-term conditions, they have poorer experience of training and worse outcomes at the end. And this occurs in medical schools for ethnic minority background train, uh, students. It occurs at recruitment, it occurs through training, it occurs in new exams, and then when you get into the workplace, it's still there. Data, this is now 11 years old, uh, from Prof. Wolf's team. The odds of failure of non-white candidates, 2.5 times higher than their white peers. 2.5 times. Recruitment. The green is ethnic minority, blue is white background. Every specialty, ethnic minorities were deemed to be less appointable. At recruitment for general practice, we use the multi-source uh, recruitment assessment, the MSRA, which other specialties use. It consists of two multiple choice papers. Within that, there is differential outcomes. Ethnic minority doctors, doctors from abroad score less. But those scores are really important. They determine your ranking and where you're going to get your job. MRCG results. And these are pooled data from the GMC over a six-year period. And you may critique that because they're summary and generalised figures. But actually, within each year, within each component, the same patterns hold. That ethnic minority doctors trained in this country will score less than their white peers. And if you're an international medical graduate, it's even less. And if we look at ARCP, which is the Annual Review of Competency Progression in Training, ARCP, excluding exam results, adverse outcomes, higher for those from ethnic minority backgrounds, even higher for international graduates. And what does this cause? That means you don't progress in your training. You have extensions. Latest figures I have from HEE. Trainees requiring extensions. Three quarters non-UK graduates. Two thirds ethnic minority background. That's not comfortable reading for me. 
So putting it all together, this is the EDI report uh, on targets and progress from the GMC published earlier this year. So mean scores for undergraduate students, lower for ethnic minority background. Asking F1 doctors how well they feel they were prepared for their first job in the National Training Survey, lower if you're from an ethnic minority background. Perceived levels of inclusivity, lower. And as we just discussed, unsatisfactory ARCP outcomes, lower. Exam results, lower. So these are generalized figures, summaries. And there is granularity in this data. But actually within each ethnic group, this holds true. And within each specialty, it holds true. So let's not make assumptions about individuals, because there are plenty of highly performing ethnic minority doctors and international graduates, and plenty of less well-performing white doctors. But the message is that, that if we look at it as a system, it means that we can take a system approach to this issue. And we can attract funding for it as well. But let's not forget the impact on that individual. Doctors who have supported over many years in this cycle. The impact of failure is huge. Failure to progress, extensions, affects your self-confidence, creates imposter syndrome, feeling you're not good enough, affects your well-being, and also affects your family and your finances. So differential attainment is a really thorny issue. And we've made very little progress over the last 20 plus years. Over my lifetime as an educator, I've made very little difference, sadly. There's fear. Fear amongst trainees of negative stereotypes. Fear they are in the demographic that's going to fail their exam. How many times have you had trainees starting and saying, I'm going to be the one who's going to fail anyway, need an extension? Fear amongst educators. How am I going to help this ethnic minority doctor without being accused of bias or discrimination? Fear amongst the college, the GMC. Judicial review, that fear hasn't gone away either. And of course, impact of COVID, that differential impact <laughs> on ethnic minority backgrounds. Black Lives Matter's movement, uh, the murder of George Floyd, perfect storm, put the absolute put the emphasis on EDI issues over the last two years, for which I'm grateful. And I would say differential statement is a symptom, not a, not a diagnosis. And the causes are complex. And studies that have corrected for factors such as language ability, prior educational performance, uh, trainer bias, social class, you can correct for all of those. But you still end up with those differential outcomes. But they are outcomes. And what we need to do sometimes is step back. What was the experience of the trainee that led to those outcomes? But then you step back further. What was the access to the curriculum that led to that experience that led to those outcomes? It's what the trainees tell me, I'm afraid. It's the doors are shut for them. Their white counterparts seem to walk through, get sponsorship and help and support, and they have to really push hard. And they don't feel as valued. It seems we're not polishing all the jewels in our pocket. And it's not just about prejudice. It's about the advantage we give to others. People talk a lot about privilege. But privilege is not the presence of benefit. It's the absence of barriers. Not benefit, but barriers. And these are the barriers that the trainees tell us they face. Again, study six years ago now. Difficulties with relating to their seniors and their peers. This perceived unfairness and bias in their recruitment and assessments. Access to the hidden curriculum. The perception of trainers, of international graduates. That lower social capital they bring. And as I said, if your scores are ranked at recruitment, you won't take your third or fourth job. 
It means you might travel an hour or two there and back to work. What's that going to do to your work-life balance and your time to study? <coughs> so, of course, this affects your well-being. And trainees report issues of bias, fitting in, belonging. So, differential is part of a much more complex, bigger picture. Of course, there are individual factors, learning styles and so forth. Language is going to be a factor. We know that language is not just a set of forms. It's also a social construct. So, you may have English as your lingua franca, but it doesn't equate to being a native speaker. English is full of nuances and idioms, which can lead to misunderstandings. And people judge competence by your level of English language. Patients, peers. And so that can lead to someone being, you know, don't have a sense of humour, for example, being a bit awkward. But on top of that, we teach communication skills, consultation skills, and we assess for them. But if you've never been taught that before, in undergraduate, postgraduate, it's like learning to ride a bicycle. You're focusing all your attention on pedaling and balancing that you can't see where you're going. And what the trainees tell us is they face racism in the workplace. Survey after survey. Even one this week from the BMA uh, showing that trainees are facing discrimination and microaggressions. But we need to think about the level up as well. What about the practice, the trust level? What's the culture there? How much induction and support are we giving to our doctors? And the higher level, what about the deanery, the college, GMC? Are our recruitment processes, assessments fair? Or are they actually neglecting certain groups? Because uncomfortably, that is systemic racism. We need to tackle that. This was, I could have pulled out lots of surveys, but this is the one from the BMA earlier this year. 90% black Asian respondents felt that racism was a problem in the medical profession. And most people don't report it because they think nothing will happen, <coughs> yeah, it won't go anywhere, or you'll be accused of being a troublemaker. 60% Asian, 50% black respondents felt it was a barrier to their career progression, as opposed to 4% white. Barriers, not benefits. And of course it affects your well-being. And the system isn't broke. It was created this way. The college is 70 years old. But it needs to adapt and change. And the NHS relies on doctors from abroad and ethnic minority doctors. Without it, it would have collapsed long ago. But we need to look, for, look after them. We need to care for them. So let's not just try to keep fixing the individual, which is what happens. Let's try to actually change the system at the same time that we do that. And my other plea is we must get away from this deficit problem. The idea that ethnic minority doctors, doctors from abroad, they have a deficit, they have a problem that we just need to solve. Actually, let's focus on the assets someone brings. Asset-based approach, positive experience and knowledge that you bring to the workplace, to the training program, and build on that. That appreciative inquiry approach. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last couple of years, to be honest. This was work done by my colleague, Dr. Patel, in the Northwest. And she surveyed doctors, international doctors, applying for core medical training. Asked them what would have helped. And these, no surprises, induction, exam support, help with ARCPs, portfolio. We had a program in HEE, the targeted GP training program. This was a program to allow trainees who were released from training, having failed one other component of the exam, a route back in for a period of 18 months to two years to retake that component. And we asked them, what would have helped first time? What would help now whilst you're back in? Same messages, three key themes they told us. Educational support, consistency of approach, 
one-to-one -one personalized learning plans, but also help with their well-being, help with issue, uh, issues of discrimination bias, someone they can report these issues to, and also telling us to support our faculty so that all trainers have the skills that can look after doctors from abroad. More recently, work done by colleagues in Wessex, fantastic survey of trainees, asking them what issues they faced, what can we do to help? And then using that information to train up their trainers to support the doctors. Three years ago, the Work Psychology Unit published this report. This was looking at deaneries that had less differential attainment compared to those who had more. What were they doing differently that was helping? And they came up with these 10 success factors and three themes. The environment. What are we doing to provide an environment that values diversity and the individual? What about the faculty? Inspirational role models who are going to be supporting these doctors. And of course, what you do. What arrangements are there for training? helping with exams, but also careers, opening those doors. So over the last 18 months, I've been working at Health Education England with colleagues from across all the uh, primary care schools in England. And we've identified differential attainment leads in each area, created a community of practice, collected the information resources. They're all doing great work but actually pooling it together so that everyone was doing similar work and sharing their resources and making it kind of available to all. And these are the kinds of things we've been doing. Thinking about selection processes, recruitment, placements based on need, not on ranking. We know the scores at MSRA predict how you're going to be in your ARCP and at the end of training paper released just a couple of weeks ago. So those scores very much kind of mirror where you're going to be. So at least we're not making it worse, but we're not making any better through training. But identifying those drop doctors early on, targeted interventions, and then hopefully we can make some progress. But also induction. Induction isn't just about policies, procedures, and the trust or whatever. It's all about cultural induction into the country, into the NHS, and all that has to happen, as well as everything else. Some areas have used, have funded a social prescriber to help the doctors and their families, to help them with settling in to accommodation and jobs and schooling. What a fantastic idea. Wish I thought of it. Some areas are funding supernumerary placements. So before that doctor goes live on their medical ward, they've worked there for two weeks, supernumerary capacity, settling in, knowing what, what the processes are. I mean, the worst stories I hear are the ones when doctors arrive on a Monday and on Wednesday they're on call at a medical tech unit. Those are frightening stories. But just imagine just fitting someone in for two weeks before. Safe for patients, safe for the doctors, safe for the team. It's a no-brainer. But also we need to develop our faculty, give them the skills, cultural competence, bias training, allyship. They need these skills to help support the doctors. And also the targeted interventions, Com communication skills, exam support, ARCP work. But it has to be individualized, one-to-one -one personalized <laughs> learning. This is a kind of template that we came up with. And the conversation starts with your well-being. And then move on to your progression and your objectives. How can we do to open doors for you? What positive recognition have you had? Building on assets. What feedback have you had? What areas need improvement? And then what help do you need with your career? Where can we guide you to? Of course, money helps. And we had money last year. And we had the same money this year. That's been fantastic. Because you have to resource this. It's not going to happen without resource. But that's only part of the story. 
we also need to think about relationships with supervisors. We need to think about negative stereotyping, bias, discrimination, and the fact that trainees often feel they don't belong, don't fit in. Stereotype threat. This is, well, this is really the risk of being judged in the light of repeated negative stereotypes, which then undermines your performance. And it's a real thing. Negative stereotypes diminishes your confidence, decreases performance, don't achieve so much, round and round it goes. And it also creates the imposter syndrome. The opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you overrate your abilities, here you underrate your abilities. And it happens especially if you feel you don't belong, you're an outsider, different. And you feel, I'm not good enough, I shouldn't be here. Affects your self-worth, self-belief. Lots of us have imposter syndrome. Over 70% the figures tell us. And it's really important to identify it. Because identification is the first step to helping. And being heard is always the first step of healing anyway. So listening to those stories. But you can prevent it by creating psychological safety within your workplace and your educational learning environments. And psychological safety is just being allowed to be human, really. It's allowed to be vulnerable. To err. So it's creating, creating that environment where it's safe to be vulnerable. That you're not going to be embarrassed for speaking up. And you're able to speak up about errors and ask for help. But also you're supported to try out new things and new ways of doing things. But with good support. Because without psychological safety, then you end up with defensive strategies. If you don't want to be seen as ignorant, well, you're not going to ask any questions. You don't want to be seen as incompetent, so you're not going to actually admit to anything. Certainly not ask for feedback or help. You don't want to be seen negative in a team, so you're not going to be doubtful or criticise. You certainly don't want to be intrusive, keep your head under the radar, so you don't offer up any ideas. I've had situations where my defensive strategies have really kicked in. I wonder if you have. Then let's put the lens of culture onto psychological safety. So it's all the features of psychological safety, but in addition, there's no assault on your identity, your background, your colour. And for me, you can do that through developing cultural competence and psychological safety as the two axes. Cultural competence is simply the ability to get on with people from different cultures and backgrounds. And it happens at both an organisation and individual level. It's creating that working culture environment that people are respected and diversity is valued. And it begins with yourself. You've got to be aware of your own blind spots, your own biases, your own stereotypes, because we all have them. Evolutionary terms, system one thinking, creates those stereotypes and biases. And those reflexive responses come out when you're under pressure, stressed, anxious, angry, hungry, tired. They lead to micro-behaviours, microaggressions. Treat someone less warmly. You soon know when someone's not connecting with you quite right. So we need to leave our biases at the door. And let our system too, reflexive, reflective processes rather, kick in, rather than our reflexive processes. So the belief you'll be treated fairly within teams is psychological safety. The belief you'll be treated fairly between individuals is actually trust. We're not doing too well on that front either. Studies go, Liz Pace's study, you know, way back, 
ethnic minority doctors feeling that bullying was linked to their identity. Consultants, superiors, cause of verbal harassment, followed by patients and families. This quote struck me from the BMA survey recently. A doctor from Pakistani background felt that their superiors, supervisors, were more friendly, helpful towards the white local graduate colleagues. And this is not unusual, and this is happening now. The surveys that are coming now are telling us the same messages. Only this week, that BMA survey, same messages were coming through. So how do we build trust? Well, as we know, relationships are the currency of learning. Without it, you're not going to get that. So it's really important to develop trust. And you can do that by reducing those power differentials, sharing stories, sharing narratives. Things like reciprocal mentoring can really help with this process. Trust has two components, actually. It's got affective trust, which is how warm you feel towards someone. And that can only be created by those chats over coffee, getting to know each other. <coughs> But there's also cognitive trust, which is trust in someone's cogn their competence, their abilities to do stuff. And you can only develop that by giving those graded challenges to trainees with support, building their assets up. But also we need to be dealing with discrimination, being open to dealing with discrimination and giving the supervisors tools to deal with issues when they're reported to them. And of course, you can't be what you can't see. So let's increase the diversity of our faculties to represent the learners they look after. The fact is that diversity is a fact. Equity is a choice. Equality is just giving everyone the same. Equity is actually giving those who need that extra support. Inclusion is the action. Belonging is the outcome. The best definition of these terms I've ever come across is Werner Meyer's quote. Diversity has been asked at the party. Inclusion has been asked to dance at the party. But belonging is being able to dance like you would at home with your family and your friends, your authentic self without feeling judged. Because if you don't have that, you end up covering. Covering is where you may dress differently, you talk differently. Call me Dr. John instead of the proper name, for example. Covering is actually quite t tiring and wearing. It affects your self-worth. Not having to bring yourself to work every day. Your front door becomes your barrier between one culture and another. You can't be yourself. <coughs> and why is that important? Well, it's right there in the middle of Maslow's hierarchy. Belonging. <coughs> Without it, you can't get to the next level of achievement or accomplishment. So, what should we be doing? Certainly be thinking about diversity. And we do this, we collect the data. Because diversity is measurable, it's, it's objective. And it's actually independent of cultural safety. But the next step up is inclusivity. We should be measuring those levels of involvement, partly subjective, partly objective, and facilitated by cultural safety. And then belonging, which is completely dependent on cultural safety. And again, surveys, asking our trainees how much they feel they're, they're involved. But then doing something about it, taking action, when we find that. So let's think about our doctor coming from abroad again. What could we do to help? Well, some proper realistic information. Help with relocation and visas. An accommodation, proper enhanced induction, not just into the NHS, but into living in a different country, supporting them, cultural safety, tackling discrimination. Of course, helping with exams and communication skills, but also helping with well-being. And then that transition into the workplace. What can we do to help with that? 
But at the next level above that, we also need to think about acknowledging their assets. The assets you bring. That's the being. But then transition through equitable experiences. Because that leads to becoming. And then that connection between you and the world around you. That belonging. So I haven't got all the answers. Leveling up medical education is a very complex issue. So it needs a complex system, adaptive leadership type response to it. This is the HEE quality framework, which is as good as any to hang your hat on. So we need to be tackling each of these areas. The learning environment, the workplace, creating cultural safety in these environments. Supporting our learners, of course we need to support our learners. Not just with exams and ARCPs, but also with their well-being and reporting issues of discrimination and unfairness. Supporting our educators, increasing the diversity of our educators, giving them the tools that can support our learners, our diverse learners. <coughs> but also the access to the curriculum, making sure that all our trainees have that equitable access. And make sure that the assessments we carry out are fair. But at that system level, what about the policies and procedures we've got? We should be looking at those through these lens. Are they fair? Who are we discriminating against? Why is there different entertainment in these exam results? What's going on? What could we do differently? But at the same time, we should be targeting those trainees, spotting, have systems in place that can spot trainees who might need help and extra support. And also we should have mechanisms of allowing trainees to report difficulties of unfairness, of discrimination, without any fear or, or judgment. But we also need to think about the workforce. That's what medical education is about anyway. It's about developing the future workforce. But sadly, the reports there aren't great. The workforce, uh, race, equality, uh, standard surveys, the race, year after year, showing difficulties uh, within secondary care and so forth for our staff. More recently, work carried out in the London race uh, by colleagues in primary care. Same issues coming through. The medical race that came out two years ago, again, differential outcomes for different groups. So we really do need to be tackling this beyond just that learning environment, but beyond into the workplace. And just a, another plea from me, really, what do we do with the doctors who've gone through training and don't come out the other end, who've not been able to pass one or other component? What about giving them a route back? They may have spent four or five years training in, in primary care, and then we've just lost them to the workforce. What about a route back for them, giving them a role in primary care with their experience and knowledge, building on, on what they've already learned? but giving them a route back into general practice rather than just ending it. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> We've talked about some uncomfortable issues. I hope you feel more comfortable to be able to talk about uncomfortable issues going forwards wherever we can, in whichever environments we're in, whatever we do. Um, I'd like to thank Dame Claire. I'd like to thank the college for the privilege of delivering the lecture this year. I'm very grateful. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank the, the audience. The company today has been fantastic. Thank you. I mean, fabulous. Yeah, you did give us uncomfortable truths, but I think you gave us truths that we could take because I think they resonate with all the discussions, debates, policies that we're trying to address. And I think you repeating them and showing us the evidence for them actually shines a light onto what we've done, but really what 
more needs to be done. And the work you're doing is spectacular. And looking at our new member ceremonies, we're seeing this in action because we're seeing the, the vibrancy, the, 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 the different ethnicity, the different places of primary qualifications of many, many of those who are joining our wonderful profession. So I think if you had maybe given this lecture a decade ago, I think probably many of this audience would feel very defensive and very uncomfortable. But actually, what you're doing is, as I said, resonating with what we're all feeling and what we're all doing. And hopefully, if you were to give it again in 10 years' time, it would be a, a redundant lecture, maybe. I suspect not. But I'd like to just thank you because... You are a spectacular clinician and a spectacular teacher and someone that is, as I said at the start, affecting change in our profession slowly, just slowly, because everything takes time. But you have done this work and, and uh, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the Royal College and to give you another applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in... In about an hour, we're going to be starting the next new member ceremony. I don't know whether you're staying, Vijay, for that, yeah. but you will see in action what we're trying to change at this college and really see your lecture being translated into reality. So thank you very much. Thank you.